Hi, everyone. So let's give this another shot. Um, so this first part might be a little bit familiar to some of you. Um, my name is Evan McCush. I'm an associate professor at Simon Fraser University. And the goal today is to discuss some of our findings from uh, the incarcerated serious and violent young offender study. And I wanted to touch on effectively four themes. First, just a general discussion of the risk factor profiles of kids who've experienced incarceration, then kind of discuss how these risk factors inform patterns of youth offending, and then discuss the adult outcomes of kids who have experienced incarceration and describe a little bit about the next steps for the incarcerated serious and young offender study. So hopefully I'll capture something that will be of interest to those who are viewing this presentation. And then perhaps um, via email or any type of comments you see, you'll be able to leave me a message and ask some questions. So I wanna thank uh, Jesse Hale and Stacey Zumakis for hosting me here. Um, I met both of them at SFU and uh, they invited me to come give this talk. Uh, so uh, very often I would collaborate with Jesse and as a grad student, Stacy and I overlap and I was regularly in her lab in her office to ask her stats questions and life questions and grad school questions. Uh, so I'm very thankful to both of them for their role in kind of mentoring me over the over the years. And now I'm uh, currently an associate professor in the School of Criminology at Simon Fraser University, which is located on the unceded traditional territories of the Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. And I think uh, because this talk is going to include a discussion of the overrepresentation of Indigenous persons, it's important to especially acknowledge the role that Canada has played in the attempted genocide and colonization of Indigenous persons and Indigenous lands. Uh, our study revealed, as one might expect, the overrepresentation of Indigenous persons and the marginalization of these persons. But our study only focuses on individual level risk factors for offending. And it would be a mistake, I think, to reduce the overrepresentation of Indigenous persons to these individual level factors. There are also broader macro level systemic issues um, that. Uh, remain ongoing and don't just date back to colonization, don't just date back to the 1960s, what we call 60s scoop, where uh, Indigenous youth were seized from their homes by the Canadian government and placed in foster care families, not just in throughout Canada, but throughout the world. Um, we currently have Indigenous First Nations reserves with unsuitable drinking water and issues with food insecurity on Indigenous lands. And this sort of brings me to my own background as a white settler who was raised uh, in the islands of Haida Gwaii. Uh, but I think what is important for me to communicate is that Haida Gwaii is a really unique and special place in terms of the ability of Indigenous persons to exert autonomy over their resources and education. So, for example, I actually went to school on an Indigenous reserve in the, a town called Skidigit. Uh, our school is called, called Skokkanai, which is, uh, translates to House of Learning. And most Canadian young persons will learn English in school and French in school, uh, whereas we were taught uh, Haida. Um, so instead of learning French as a second language, we learn the Haida language, but also the culture and our art and so on. So uh, as Stacy could tell you, my French is uh, terrible, and but that's because I was taught in this school that focused on the Haida language. And it's not just about the language, but it's about the culture, the industry of fishing and logging that uh, the Haida are able to sort of exert autonomy over. So I think it's a great example of what can happen when autonomy is given back to Indigenous persons and the lands that they have been basically asking to have returned to them for hundreds of years. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the project that led to these findings and how this study started. So it certainly did not study with me. There are many people who worked on the project and created the framework that I am now allowed to benefit from. Most importantly, my former supervisor, Professor Ray Carrado, who started the study in 1998, where different graduate student research assistants went into custody centers throughout the province of British Columbia to interview kids who are experiencing incarceration. 
And um, Canada's current youth justice system really emphasizes reserving incarceration for youth involved in serious offenses and has been successful in reducing the use of incarceration just anecdotally. When I started working as a research assistant in the custody center that you see on the screen, there were about 110 kids who were incarcerated. And I think just before the pandemic, there were only about 12 kids in this custody facility. But it's important to keep in mind that part of the reason for the reduction in the use of custody was to only place in custody youth who were involved in especially serious and violent offenses. So we're not talking about, for example, in the United States, where we'll see boys and girls incarcerated for status-based offenses, or like skipping school, drinking in public, and so on. These are not the types of offenses, nor the types of youth that we see in this project. So it's important not to try and think about this as a generalizing to all youth involved in criminal or antisocial behavior. To give you an example of the, the study uh, itself, so for about 13, 14 years, about 1,700 kids who were incarcerated were interviewed. We call cohort one the Young Offenders Act cohort. Uh, so they were interviewed during one particular piece of legislation uh, that ran from 1984 to 2003. And then cohort two, which captured the Youth Criminal Justice Act that ran from 2003 until current. And in this sample, about 20% of our girls and about 20% of ind individuals in the sample self-reported an Indigenous background. To give you an example of the severity of the sample, about 10% were involved in a homicide offense and about 12% were involved in a sexual offense over the course of their life course, and this includes offending in adulthood. So I wanted to begin just relatively simply by describing some of the risk factors that we measured using a semi-structured and structured interviews with a variety of youth throughout uh, the province of British Columbia. Beginning with their social environment, one of the things that became really apparent with not when we began to analyze the data, but even we kind of recognized this when we we're doing the interviews, was that risk factors in this sample were so prevalent that we had to kind of reorientate how we would measure risk. So for example, if 90% of all kids have left home, then we can't really use this as a risk factor to understand offending. So to have a little bit more variety in the response options, we looked at things, for example, like leaving home before the age of 12 or getting kicked out of home before the age of 12. Uh, we found, and this is going to be a theme throughout this presentation, that girls present with a more serious risk factor profile than boys. So you can see here that they're leaving home and getting kicked out of home more often than boys. They're less likely to attend school, more likely to experience physical and sexual abuse. I would especially note that I think that the percent of sexual abuse within our male sample is underestimated because there's definitely, especially in a custody environment, a stigmatization around the acknowledgement of experiencing sexual abuse. So for example, if we were to look at file-based information, we might find sexual abuse is actually much more prevalent than indicated in this particular slide. Mental health in general was an issue for all persons in the sample. So about 90% of boys and girls acknowledged uh, at least one type of mental health issue. Some of the more common uh, mental health issues included ADHD and depression. What was also noteworthy is that when we look into the familial backgrounds of boys and girls, there was also a high prevalence of mental health issues for girls in particular. When we measured features of psychopathy uh, via the psychopathy checklist youth version, you can see here that only about 10% of girls and just under 20% of boys scored what would be considered a high rating on the psychopathy checklist youth version. So I'll acknowledge in this presentation that features of psychopathy are an incredibly important risk factor for offending, but also this kind of um, de-emphasizes or basically contradicts um, early like 1990, 1995 claims that there were emerging like youth super predators and that our custody centers would be filled with quote unquote psychopaths. This is absolutely not what we see in our study. Uh, similar to our discussion of leaving and getting kicked out of home, when we began to look at substances like marijuana and alcohol use, almost all 
participants reported that they used alcohol or marijuana over their life course. So we need to look at more specific and more serious forms of substances. And you can see that even these more serious substances are quite prevalent among the sample, especially for girls. You can see, for example, that nearly 50% of girls have used heroin, over 50% crack cocaine, just under 50% have used crystal meth. Often girls discussing their experiences would note things like uh, a benefit to them of using crystal meth was uh, mental alertness. Uh, the inability to sleep was actually sometimes seen as a positive thing because it was seen as a way to protect themselves from harm if they were living on the streets and worried about falling asleep and being victimized. So we see a little bit of a paradox here. Girls presented with the more severe risk factor profile, but boys in general were engaging in a higher likelihood of all different types of criminal offenses, whether it ranging from assault to uttering threats to break and enters to homicide. We see down the bottom right corner that sexual assault was extremely rare for this sample. Well, that's actually not true. Um, about 1% of boys and 1% of girls self-reported involvement in a sexual offense. But when we looked at official records, it was closer to about 10% of boys and still about 1% of girls. So quite clearly, and we sort of understand why based on the stigmatization of having been involved in a sex offense, boys were not forthcoming about their involvement in a sexual offense because we know about 12% uh, of them did go on to receive a conviction for a sex offense over the life course. So to kind of uh, contextualize all of this, I thought it would be useful to boil things down to what does a single case look like? So we're talking about John here, and I didn't select John because they were the most extreme or serious person in the sample. In fact, they're, they're almost they're maybe a little bit more severe, but closer to average than extreme. Um, so just like to demonstrate like the complexity of intervention and treatment needs of a single youth who's incarcerated. So we're talking about John, uh, he mentioned that he did not know who his father was and that he did not want to have a relationship with his mother nor his brother. He noted that his mother had a drinking problem. This information was verified by reports from child welfare services um, who were regularly intervening because John's mother's partners would abuse John, his mother and his brother, and that John was suffering from unresolved trauma due to those instances of abuse. He was also diagnosed with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. Um, when we were asking about self-identity, uh, he acknowledged or like sort of indicated that some of his more strong traits or what sort of typified himself was that he was unattractive and poor. When we did mental health screening assessment using the MAZI, the um, um, Massachusetts Adolescent Screening for Youth uh, instrument, he, his profile was shown that he was very angry and irritable. Uh, he began using alcohol and an ecstasy at a very early age, and this was in part related to his placement in foster care. So he spent 30, he had 30 different placements in foster care. Some of these were with foster families, others were kinship placements, so they could include placements with aunts, uh, grandparents, and so, so on. Um, but in a lot of these foster care placements, he was exposed to other crime-involved youth, and this is how he began becoming involved in drug use as well as criminal behavior. He, at school, uh, dropped out at age 13, but was regularly also asked to leave for threatening teachers, bullying others, and being disruptive. And in total, between the ages of 12 and 17, 12 being the age of criminal responsibility in Canada and 17 being the end of the age of youth justice system involvement, he incurred 26 convictions and spent over a thousand days in custody. So basically close to three years in custody in that six year window. So half of his adolescence, essentially. So the, the idea here was just to show how complex these needs are. Um, and when you have all of these different needs, the question becomes, so what do we do first? Like we can't solve all problems or all needs. So is there something that we could prioritize? So I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, what matters most just for youth offending. So when we, one of the papers that we did looked at the relationship with FASD and youth offending, and we found that FASD was related to an earlier onset and more versatile pattern of youth antisocial behavior. However, 
it seemed that the reason why FASD related to elevated levels of offending is that FASD was strongly related to being placed in foster care and experiences of abuse and coming from a family with an extremely marginalized background. And once we accounted for these factors, the relationship between FA FASD and offending seemed to dissipate somewhat. So it was accounted for by these other risk factors, which is to say, if we were able to help uh, improve the social environments of kids with FASD, that might directly reduce involvement in offending. So as I mentioned, psychopathy was not overwhelming among sample participants, but it was a particularly important risk factor for youth recidivism, engagement in institutional misconduct while incarcerated, as well as sex offending. Uh, Gina Vincent, as part of her PhD dissertation, looked at female youth recidivism as well, found that psychopathy was not especially informative of girls' involvement in uh, re offenses. Talked a little bit about substance use. And as you can see here, what we did was run a, what's called a latent class analysis. So on the X axis, you can see different types of substances. And on the Y axis, you can see the different probabilities associated with the use of that substance. And then the different lines represent different latent classes or different groups. So we identified one group called what we call street drug use where this profile was associated with greater versatility of antisocial behavior. Girls were also more likely to be in this substance use pattern compared to boys. And those who were involved in the street drug use pattern, so you can see, for example, they had high probabilities of using cocaine, heroin, crack cocaine, and crystal meth. They were basically coming from an extremely uh, dysfunctional home environment, repeatedly in foster care and um, routinely exposed to living on the street. And that kind of brings us to our third theme and sort of one of the new directions of our study. So when I was in grad school, one of the books that I uh, read was about uh, the Lobin Sampson study of uh, a reanalysis of Sheldon and Eleanor Gluck's Unraveling Juvenile Delinquency Study, where they had a sample of uh, boys in the Boston, Massachusetts area who are followed up basically to around age 70, at least for some of them. And one of the claims that Lobb and Sampson made in this book was that individuals would desist by default. That they would just automatically stop offending in adulthood, even for those individuals who were, in their view, serious offenders. So they felt that informal social controls or adult roles like being married, having children, being employed, that these would just sort of automatically happen over the life course for all persons, regardless of their background characteristics. Um, so they describe these informal social controls as structurally induced. The, the, the idea was that there would be macro level social structure factors that would funnel individuals into adult roles. So as individuals enter their mid twenties, for example, they would just automatically kind of begin to get jobs as they enter their late 30s maybe they're beginning to have uh, children or starting families and so on so the effect is said that regardless of somebody's past history they will desist desistance will always happen um, and that individuals didn't even need to make a conscious decision to change or to desist that this would just be effectively automatic and my interviews with these kids coming from extremely marginalized circumstances made it difficult for me to square Love and Samson's assertions with my own kind of experiences talking to these young persons. So our goal was to transition the study from interviewing new youth to instead following the same youth over time. And this all basically culminated with a book we published a couple of years ago called The Life Course of Serious and Violent Youth Grown Up. And I'm happy to uh, let people know more about this book or how to get it uh, if they simply send me an email. Um, so what we found, and this is just like a little bit of a quick example of the continuity of offending over time. So we found actually that about 90% of participants in our sample incurred at least one new conviction in adulthood. About 80% recidivated between ages 18 to 23. Even when we get into older stages of the life course, like 30 through 39, about half of the sample is still justice system involved. And this could give a very pessimistic view of things and to sort of give an example of this, uh, while I was working as a research assistant in the youth custody center 
uh, a probation officer, been working there for about 20 years, asked me like, what percent of our clients come back into the adult system? So we're trying all these things in the youth custody center, programming, improving community reentry needs. How many of them stop offending? I basically said, well, basically all of them end up in the adult system. And so in part that's true, but I also didn't like really like the way that I phrased that. And because um, what Mark, the probation officer said to me was, so basically what you're saying is that everything that I've been doing for the last 20 years has been wrong, that nothing has worked, that we're not helping these kids in any way. And I think we need to begin to reframe how we define patterns of uh, offending persistence and desistance. And that when we have these youth who are engaging in really high rates of offending, some of them are committing, averaging five, six convictions each year during the period of adolescence, it's very difficult to get them to automatically stop offending. It's not like at age 18, 19, there's some sort of switch that goes off and they can just cease offending altogether. And so this analogy has been made by other people before, I'm sure, but it's like driving a car down the highway. You're going 100 kilometers an hour and all of a sudden there's construction crew ahead and you need to come to an automatic stop. Well, you actually can't go from 100 to zero. You have to go from 100 to 80 to 60 to 40 and on and on until you can finally reach zero. And so there's a slowing down process. And that's what we need to think about when we're dealing with youth involved and especially serious and violent offending is to acknowledge the slowing down process. And one of the ways to do so is by measuring offending trajectories. So you can see here um, on the x-axis, we have age from age 12 to 34. And then on the y-axis, we have the number of convictions. So we can see different patterns of chronic offending over the life course, but also uh, really most of the kids in the sample, or at least 40% of them, are associated with this low rate pattern where they're kind of offending a little bit at age 18, 19, but we can see that by around age 22, 23, their reconviction rate is effectively zero. They're reached a near zero level of reoffending. So we wanted to understand what are some of the factors associated with these offending trajectories. Uh, Kelsey Gushu, who's a PhD student here at SFU, she's been especially focused on girls. And what she found was that when we analyze boys and girls together, very rarely do we see girls in, for example, that high rate chronic group. You might see amongst that high rate chronic group, maybe only two, three percent are actually women. Um, and this is, again, is kind of that paradox of girls presenting with more serious risk factors, yet they're disproportionately found in that low rate group. So it's the idea that maybe some of these risk factors are not actually risk factors for offending for girls, but rather risk factors for uh, substance use, depression, uh, quality of health, and so on. But what Kelsey then did was say, okay, well, I don't want to just compare boys to girls. I want to examine trajectories of girls alone. And when she did that, she did find patterns of chronic offending. They just weren't as high rate for the boys, but she did find that girls persisted into adulthood and factors like a negative self-identity and early substance use and sexual behavior were informative of these trajectories. We also found something basically the same for Indigenous youth, where they were more likely than white youth to present with risk factors, yet they were not more likely to be associated with one of those chronic offending trajectories. What also might be surprising is that when we examine individuals involved in sexual offenses and when we examine individuals involved in homicide offenses, and I'm talking specifically about sex offending and homicide offending in adolescents, they were not more likely to be associated with this high rate chronic pattern of offending. Um, and for the purposes of time, I'm kind of going to move past that. But if you have questions about that finding, I'm happy to, to ask if you follow up. Uh, not surprisingly, we found that youth gang involvement was associated with more serious patterns of offending over time, including things like total violence. One of the interesting things that I found uh, during uh, my PhD was there was one individual in our sample who was a well-known leader of a high-profile gang in British Columbia. We're just going to call it the BC gang. And he committed one homicide offense when he was around 15, 16 years old, and then another homicide offense almost about 10, 15 years later. What was interesting was that 
some of the persons involved in the first homicide offense were also involved in that second homicide offense with this gang leader. So we were kind of curious about like, who gets recruited to be involved in a homicide offense? So what you see in this uh, image here are individuals, uh, some of whom are members of the gang and some of whom are not members of the gang. So if you see a little GM number next to it, subscript, that indicates that they were a member of the BC gang. And each line that you see connecting to what we call nodes represent a co-offense. So for example, you could see the very middle GM1. You can see to the left of GM1 is GM68 with a white line. That's a co-offense uh, that occurred between the two of them. So we had 18 members of this gang who were in our actual study. So we examined their co-offending networks. What we found was that they mostly co-offended with non-gang members people who are not part of the BC gang, about 75% of the nodes that you see in this network are people who were not members of the BC gang. But you'll notice that some lines are white and some are red. The red lines represent co-offenses that resulted in a homicide offense. And what you'll notice about these red lines is that 100% of those with a red line connecting to them are BC gang members. So homicide seemed to be a members only offense that gm1 had particular people that he would trust to recruit or ask to get involved in a homicide offense uh recall i mentioned that samson lob talked about informal social control as a normative part of the life course so through court and uh correctional data we were able to gather risk assessment information on the quality of family relationships, living relationships, partner relationships, vocational skills, and employment. Um, and so we're only looking really between the ages of 18 to 25 here, but you can see that for most participants in the sample, it was very rare to have quality family relationships in terms of like them being positive or instances where they're not causing interference, but you can see family relationships, living arrangements, less than 5% of the sample are talking about these things in positive terms and help terms of helping promote their pathway to the systems. So what we also found is that what you experience in adolescence is informative of these adult outcomes. So if you offended more in adolescence, your family relationships, employment, and so on are going to be of a poor quality. If you were incarcerated for a longer period of time, same thing. If you had a higher level of risk in adolescence, same thing. So what we did is we added some of these items together to create an informal social control scale that we then used for a few other analyses. One of them was related to foster care. So what we found was that foster care is maybe one of the most important risk factors for offending in this sample. Foster care um, also predicted the quality of informal social control in adulthood. So kids who are placed in foster care were associated with that form of cumulative disadvantage where they had less positive family relationships employment outcomes and so on in adulthood. And we found that informal social controls in adulthood prospectively predicted conviction. So basically you're looking, this is a, a grad student, Talene Blakely's work, found that four sources of informal social control between ages 18 and 25 basically predicted a higher rate of convictions from about ages 26 to 29 but also that there was a direct effect that remained of foster care on reconvictions in adulthood. So even that early experience of foster care was predicting continued convictions. Continuing with the theme of informal social control, we looked at the relationship between features of psychopathy in adolescence. So things like uh, interpersonal dominance, manipulativeness, callous and unemotional traits, uh, a lack of attachment or caring towards others. We found that this was informative of selection effects. So effectively, features of psychopathy reduced the likelihood of having positive sources of adult informal social control. They were also informative of a higher rate of offending. So x-axis wave 1 through 20 was basically a post measurement of informal social control. And we found that features of psychopathy were associated with these higher rate chronic offending trajectories measured 20 years into the future. What we also found was that 
Informal social control helped influence desistance. So the Y axis was representing probabilities of being a member of this desistance trajectory. And we found that informal social control increased the likelihood of desistance. So you can see along the X axis as informal social control improves, the probability of desistance improved as well. But the magnitude of this probability ended up being lower for persons with features of psychopathy. So we call this treatment effect heterogeneity. Informal social control functions differently depending on a person's level of features of psychopathy. So I talked about John at the beginning about his adolescence. So what happened to John in adulthood? And this is sort of an example of what happens uh, when intervention doesn't work or is not offered. To be very clear, like we also have success stories of people who are like John in adolescence who are now no longer involved in criminal behavior. But uh, for John, his family and social environment remained poor. Uh, he was diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder and uh, due to daily use of crystal methamphetamine, uh, had experienced a drug-induced psychosis. He had about nine new convictions and about 1,400 days spent in custody between ages 18 to 28. He remains in custody to date as a result of stabbing a man who he basically said, I stabbed him because he was sitting on a bench smiling and I didn't like that. And the media described this crime as senseless. And I wanted to kind of mention this because I think as criminologists, our job to kind of explain that these crimes are not actually senseless. It's kind of like we see this repeatedly used when it comes to mass shootings in the United States. We can actually can begin to make sense of them. We know John's background. We know what his risk was and what can happen with a lack of suitable intervention and treatment needs being met. So just very quickly to wrap up, um, in terms of what we're doing in the future, one of the really sad things that is uh, important to mention and kind of things that we didn't expect to study when uh, beginning this project is we found that about 10% of all of our participants are deceased by the age of 35. And so now we're trying to understand why, including how uh, different risk factors might increase mortality across uh, ethnicity. So what we've found, for example, this is the work of uh, PhD student, Jen Li Shen, is observing that for indigenous youth in particular, substance use is increasing the risk of early mortality. We're also now trying to understand like what is going on with the experience of incarceration. So you see here, uh, we've mapped basically the network structure of a prison unit and who has the most ties on the unit, who is engaging in the greatest number of institutional misconduct, and how this information can be used to understand if they are, have developed these uh, new social connections in prison, will this influence continued offending in the community? How does prison misconduct and prison, mis prison victimization occur across social networks? Does even just positive socialization increase somebody's risk of being involved in misconduct or victimization. Um, a couple of surprising things have been that we are observing for this very specific sample that incarceration, changes in incarceration reduce offending. So as individuals experience increases within individual increases in incarceration, uh, later on they do reduce their offending Really important to contextualize this is, does this mean that incarceration is good? No, absolutely not. Number one, take into consideration our high specific sample. And two, take into consideration their lives in the community. If they are uh, repeatedly engaging in substance use, if they have no financial prospects, employment prospects, and so on and so on, incarceration might be a suitable alternative. That doesn't make incarceration good. That doesn't mean that they are thriving in custody is just sort of an example of what happens when their living situation is already extremely challenging. And so similarly, we find that spending more time in custody is actually reducing a person's likelihood of mortality. But again, those sort of same caveats apply. Uh, so thank you uh, for those of you who are continuing to watch this. Uh, I apologize uh, that things didn't go that well on the recording, but hopefully this will be helpful. Uh, take care, everyone, and I hope to see you all in Australia someday.